The Victoria Arts Council respectfully acknowledges the Lekwungen speaking people within whose traditional territory we operate. And the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Masonic First Nations, whose historical relationship with this land continue to this day. We raise our hands in gratitude for the ancestors, matriarchs, hereditary leaders, and of course the artists from these lands. And we give thanks for the privilege of living and working here. My name is Kagan McFadden, and I'm the executive director of the Victoria Arts Council, as well as the co-lead for the Victoria chapter of Creative Mornings. And uh, I'm joined here by or with COSAR, and um, COSAR is the program coordinator for the Victoria Arts Council, and we'll be um, running the session. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here, and welcome to Creative Mornings. Uh, Creative Mornings is a global uh, organization and every month we have a theme and September's theme is simplicity. In the design traditions of Scandinavian and Japanese minimalism, the paring down of possessions creates a greater sense of tranquility and ease. Simplicity invites us to, am to imagine how rich we might feel when we make do with less. Where can you exercise restraint and streamline excess? How will you find clarity amidst chaos? The Gothenburg chapter of Creative Mornings has chosen this theme, and the illustration is by Jessica Jamting. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, I would invite you to please uh, tell your friends about us because the number one way that people find out about Creative Mornings is through word of mouth. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, the City of Victoria and the CRD for their support as well as HCMA, which is an architecture firm that designs buildings, brands, and shared experiences that connect people. Finally, I'd like to mention that today we are sponsored by the Victoria Festival of Authors, and our speaker, Sonnet LaBay, is one of the participating authors in this festival. Please go to their website link and check out. They have a very interesting programming happening in the month of October. And as you may know, we are from the Victoria Arts Council. And in September and October until October 29th, we have a group exhibition in our main gallery, the Pat Martin Bates Gallery from 1800 Store Street, Victoria. It's called Don't Look Now, and it's a focused group exhibition curated from existing and new works by artists from Victoria and Vancouver. Thematically, this is an exploration of the various ways in which fear permeates our society from the personal to the cultural. Todd Lambeth, Wendy Welch, Brandon Lee Sadish Tang, and Monster Boy are the featured artists in this exhibition. And lastly, I'd like to mention that we also have a number of uh, satellite spaces and galleries uh, in town, around town, including the Victoria International Airport and five Greater Victoria Public Libraries. We'd love you, love for you to visit our website and learn more information. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Sonnet LeBay. Sonnet LeBay is a Canadian poet, performer, editor, and professor. They are the author of A, Strong, a Strange Relief, Killarno, Anima Canadensis, and Sonnet Shakespeare. They teach creative writing in English at Vancouver Island University and are a poetry editor at Brick Books. They had their first solo performance of songs and poems at Nanaimo's Port Theatre in 2021. And to tell you a little bit about the talk we have today, they've titled the talk, The Energy of Simplicity. Memorable poetic moments often work as elegant mathematical equations do, with a simplicity that embodies infinite dimension. Is it true that poems that land strongly with a live listening audience are less syntactically or syllabically complex than contemporary poems that aim to satisfy a book reader? In their talk, LeBay will discuss what they've learned about simplicity from writing poems for today's page and writing poems for performance and song. Uh, so please put your Zoom hands together for Sonnet and I'll allow them to share their screen with us and start the talk. Thank you. Hello. I'd like to uh, I'd like to begin by uh, acknowledging that I am joining you from Snanaimo territory. Um, when I am looking at this at the screen, I see mainly you, Kosar. I don't see myself. Does everybody mainly see me? Is that how it's working? 
Um, yeah. I can I can see you and I can also allow you to be spotlighted if you'd like. Uh, I guess whatever whatever works for okay for the for the talk. Okay. okay. So yes, thank you very much to to uh, those um, Halkomenum speaking peoples with which I've been able to talk and learn about the land that that I'm on. Um, the poetry that I'll share with you a little bit later in this talk will uh, I hope speak to um, the experience of trying to find one's own identity and belonging on uh, unceded and colonized territory. Um, okay, so listening to that that description of what I said I was going to talk about gives me a little bit of pause because it was difficult to actually figure out what I have learned from writing um, songs and poet poems. So I'll just, uh, what I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about what, what considering simplicity led me to think about. Um, and then it, it really made, gave me a lot of uh, pause about metaphor. It really made me think about the elegance of metaphor and the way that um, metaphor expresses complexities simply. So then after I introduce, I'll do a little bit of a counterpoint between some of what Jan Zwicky has taught about metaphor and some examples of metaphor, just so that we can um, feel those set against each other, feel the, the explanations of metaphor and some metaphors that I find particularly great uh, sitting against each other. And then I will share a little bit of my own work with you and we can talk about the two different approaches that I've taken to some similar material and where the simplicity uh, comes in and whether or not there's more effectiveness in, in that simple approach than in the complex approach. Oh, and I'll also ask you to write. If you feel like it, you can also, uh, there's a little bit of a writing exercise. Okay, so I was asked today to talk about simplicity in relation to my practice. My practice has been, since I was in my mid-twenties, poetry, which is not an art form that's particularly often thought of as simple. I teach a lot of first-year poetry students and many uh, poetry workshops and few students, like beginners, come in thinking that poetry is simple. Uh, they often come into the learning space thinking this is a hard thing that I'm going to learn how to do and I'm going to get better at doing this hard thing. They know or they understand that the level of language skill involved in producing the poems that they love is often high and so think of the practice as difficult. And when our freshman class reads poems together too, students have the experience of learning that if they read a poem closely, that poems that look simple on the surface and are easy to read still have layers of complexity that are there to appreciate and relate to and savor. So I think that can lead to a sense that, that poems have these hidden, obscure, um, com complicated intentions uh, rather than rather than an attempt to be clear or be um, expressive about something that that in itself is inherently complex and that we're trying to bring a clarity to right so i asked myself if there's anything simple about good poetry one of the things i love most about poetic expression when it's doing what it does best are that layers of complexity and nuance can be captured in tiny little phrases the learning curve um, as far as writing compelling poetry can be steep. The command of grammar required to be fluidly expressive in language to me is similar. I mean, I'm, I'm using metaphors to explain myself. So the, uh, the command of grammar required to be fluidly expressive in language to me is similar to the kind of shape a body must be in to be fluidly expressive in dance. Or, and so just as there are moves and acrobatic steps that that body can do uh, to be expressive and that a body that only moves for practical reasons would find difficult, the movement and the gesture itself often looks really simple. Um, when a skilled singer moves through the notes of a song, they sound like they glide easily into high and rich notes. 
Um, so, and they sound like, and it probably is like, the expression for them is as simple as speaking. But that simplicity that they are able to bring to the gesture is the result of years of training and very um, intricately coordinated muscles. And so it is with poetry. Um, the phrases that, that delight us might be easy to pronounce and use very simple language, but their simple directness is the outcome of years of trying uh, to express the wisdom and depth in our complex, of our complex reality in ways that represent the individual truths of a life lived. So that kind of basic simplicity of just a person going around uh, witnessing things and living their life while at the same time honoring multiple truths, multiple perspectives, multiple dimensions, cosmic dimensions, atomic dimensions, and, and emotional uh, complexities. So um, I thought as an example, I would show you First of all, this. Can you see that? Can you see that screen? Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. This this is a poem by Ronald Johnson. I wrote I wrote a whole dissertation on this guy, and I invite you to 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 respond to this. So we'll even leave out we'll leave out the bottom part. How, how would you read this if somebody were to read this out loud? Well, I think that I, I'd be tempted to read it very quickly because the words fall into each other. But I think that, that it's counterintuitive and perhaps one should read it slowly and, and keep the words separated as much as possible. That would be my inclination, uh, not to let them run together. Simon, what words, do you, what words do you see? I'm looking at earth, 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 and so on. Great, thank you. Okay, would anybody else read that differently? Thank you, Simon. I, uh, go ahead, Kosar. At first glance, I saw earth, but then it was earth, the earth or earth the art and ear the art, the art. <laughs> and so it's different words start popping out as I look look more deeply. So ear the art was kind of what I decided the first part was. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. I see somebody in the chat. Ear, hearth, hear, art, yeah. Okay, so this, this is not, uh, this poem is not, necessarily metaphoric it's it's taking a word well it depends on how you look at it but if if the first thing you see like the first thing i saw was simply earth 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 and just earth set next to each other or the word earth set next to another one set next to another one set next to another one that that act of just placing some concepts beside each other um, in this case, so close to each other that they don't even have the space that we usually leave between words. Um, the simple act of, of placing those two, well, of placing two representations of the same thing, but two words together in the same space uh, offers the opportunity to see their contours differently, like the very act of just kind of placing them next to each other um, has the effect of opening up their resonances. This is a visual, a visual effect and also a potentially affects how we read it. So there's a bit of a, a sonic effect, but I, I wanted to show it to you because for me, it's such a great example of how something very, a very simple choice can actually have these multiple resonances. And that's uh, kind of what I love. And it keeps going across lines, heart, it, H, ear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and t for me, this this poem is um, speaks to, like, if there was a meaning to it, actually, I should ask you, 
and so once I start teaching, I'm like looking at the time, I'm like, Sonnet, you're going to blow your time out of the water. But I, I, I wonder about you, uh, if this was a poem that was like speaking in sentences about what it feels and what's going on uh, emotionally, how might you describe that? Given that we saw all those words in it. I, I think I feel like warm feelings and uh, kind of, I don't know, earth tones, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And a little bit of like compassion or kind feelings. Wonderful. Thanks, Kosar. Simon, did you have your um, Sorry, to me, it's very reminiscent of what happens in prayer when, for, for example, for years on end, people will repeat the same the same prayers, um, oftentimes in languages that they aren't completely familiar with. And um, the, the meanings blur and the sound blurs as well. Mm -hmm. it, it feels akin to prayer to me. Thank you. Yeah, like a, like a mantra, like a chant, like a, an invocation. Um, okay, thanks. Anybody else want to say anything? Oh, there's chat. Chat, folks. I was going it feels like to a, add... feed, a heartbeat. Yeah, I'm Daniela here. I was going to add um, that it seems to kind of the way it's packed um, and close to each other and there's no space between the words makes me want to think about the how art and ear, hearing, our senses, our heart, the earth, and how that all these interface and connect and intertwine. Thank you so much, Daniela. Yeah, that's that's sort of what I'm getting off of it too. Like the sense, the senses and the earth and nature and art are all part of the same ecosystem. Me Meharuna? Yes, yes. I was just going to add um, there. It feels very like a body, a bodily aspect for me. Um, and um like i i saw the word heart first and and now i'm seeing here the earth and so it feels like um it's both uh, um the literal aspect of this but there's also this body fluid um emotional uh sense like sensibility senses of hearing the earth and um so i'm kind of stuck in that here the earth it's almost like a uh, like a reminder, I guess, for lack of a better word, of of the body of earth, the body of the being. Yeah, there's a lot of meaning. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, we could write, we could probably individually write essays on the different angles uh, that this poem offers us. And so I, I, I offer that to you as well. Um, for those of you who are maybe less familiar, the, the veteran poets will know um, how beautifully metaphor works to just set set one thing against another thing um, to let those resonances happen. And that that even though it's it can be a simple act to just say this is this or this is like that, um, the complexities that come from you as the agent, you as the body making that choice to see two things as as similar or to say that one is like the other or to just even just to put them beside each other is a it. it it can be a simple gesture, but the potentials um, as you experiment and play with setting two things, setting two concepts next to each other, um, feeling those vibes can be rich and deep, even if the language is simple or the um, concepts are simple. This is Ronald Johnson. Ronald Johnson. Okay, so for you, uh, if you have writing, do you have any, do you have writing stuff in front of you, people? You have the op the opportunity to write something down. I okay. Think, yes. All right. So, uh, please write down um, a household appliance or two. Then write down uh, a spice or two, a spice, an evocative spice for you. And then write down uh, 
an endangered species or two. And then last, um, you can write down love, fear, ambition, and grief. So now you should have, uh, if you've written down love, fear, ambition, and grief, then you have a bunch of abstracts of of human experience and emotion and now and you've got a bunch of concrete images you've got some appliances some spices and some animals and so i invite you now to just uh set two things beside each other like we can be as simple as uh the question can be like love is like what or love is what or fear is a what or or the other way around, like an air fryer is ambition. So basically, I'm just asking you to circle one abstract and then circle another, uh, an, uh, one of the concrete things, one of the objects or, or things or beings that you would link it to. And maybe that can come up in the chat. We won't have time to like uh, share what we did, but... Um, we might have, we might, it might come up in the chat. Okay, so I'm going back to this. So this is, uh, so now I'm just going to move through some slides, um, giving a little bit of what Jan's wiki has to say about metaphor, because she manages to, she writes entire books about the philosophy of metaphor, the phenomenology of metaphor. And is wonderfully deep and elegant about uh, articulating the complexity of the ways that metaphor knows. Uh, so what I'm going to do is set her complex kind of uh, theorizing or explicating or philosophizing around metaphor. I'm going to do what she says is a, is a kind of knowledge, which is set things next to each other so that we just have her, her, her words resonating as then we take in um, a couple metaphors that I like. So a metaphor sets one thing beside another and says, see, they have the same form, which is to say, they make the same gesture, they mean in the same way. Why then is metaphor as a linguistic trope dependent on an implicit not? Metaphor results from an overriding of calcified gestures of thought by being. So here's one of my favorite metaphors from an excerpt of I Felt a Funeral in My Brain by Emily Dickinson. So we're in the middle of the poem when she says, and then I heard them lift a box and creak across my soul. We're in her mind right now. And those same boots of lead again, and sorry, with those same boots of lead again, then space began to toll. And as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear and eye and silence, some strange race wrecked solitary here being itself, being an ear. Metaphor is a species of understanding, a form of seeing as, it has, as we might say, flex. We see simultaneously similarities and dissimilarities. In metaphor, we experience a gestalt shift from one distinct intellectual and emotional complex to another in an instant of time. A metaphor then is also a meta image. It's multiply resonant. Langston Hughes, mother to son. This is just the beginning of the poem. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It had tax in, it's had tax in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. I don't know, for me, like, I've never, I've never even thought of a crystal stair. Even when I was thinking of like, you know, imagining Cinderella when I was young, those stairs were like marble or something. 
but they weren't made of crystal. And the beautiful stuff and stuff sounds and crystal stare, um, and it's put in the mom's voice. Life for me ain't been no crystal stare. A good metaphor is no more a clever artifact than it is an, an intelligently musical use of language. Both in different ways are attempts to tell the truth, to get at shapes of what is. A good metaphor is the expression of a homology, an isomorphism. So uh, those, are, those mean like similar shapes, isomorphism, like having the same shape between the way two, two things gesture. And I love that she uses the word gesture because I do think of of a dance move or or a a breath gesture. The eyes lid. This is this is uh, this was from part of her her work too, where she took what what's a dead metaphor for us eyelid, dead metaphor meaning that it no longer has that spark of putting two separate things together so that we see them the same. We've been using this metaphor for so long that we don't even see it anymore. The implied is not in a metaphor points to a gap in language through which we glimpse the world. That which we glimpse is what the is in metaphor points to. That's, that's, uh, we could sit and stare at that for like a good five minutes. From Cut by Sylvia Plath. What a thrill, my thumb instead of an onion the top quite gone, except for a sort of hinge of skin, a flap like a hat, dead white than that red plush. It's the hinge of skin for me, right? Like you can just imagine that little, that, that, and like the in, in, the, the rhyme in there, so that the hinge feels really skinny. And then the red plush, that's, that's not even a full metaphor, but you hear the rush and gush of the bleeding in in the plush amazing okay so i'm looking at time and it's 11 27 so what i'm going to ask is do you still can i still read you a poem kelso do we kelso do, do we have still time for me to like read and sing or is the questions the most important thing kosar uh i would i would personally say continue and let's hear more um yeah, I think we still have time. Okay. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do move into then is reading you, well, giving you two examples of me trying to do the same thing. Um, in this book, my last book, for me, the metaphor, the simplicity of it is the concept. These are big, dense poems, and in each of them, a, uh, a Shakespeare sonnet is is buried in the language. Because of time, I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but this, it, for me, this is an example of coming at it, coming at the, say, the, the experience material with a degree of complexity in the language and a simplicity in the concept of burying a Shakespeare sonnet and burying the canonical work, uh, burying like, a tool of uh, colonial education, burying that with my embodied, a narrative of my embodied experience. And then I will play you something I've been moving into song in part because the complexity of poetry and who gets to hear it and the emotional affect for me, um, I'm exploring if I can reach more people with a kind of simplicity but I will have to leave that for other for folks to judge. So here we go. Here's the first attempt. Trigger warning for racism and the N word. Okay. I'm not sure whether it happened in Manitoba or Alberta. Go home, they complained. Go back wherever packies or niggers come from. Was I seven years old? Was I five? The day was cloudy. There was wind and a sidewalk underfoot, a path of cement on which we kids marched. 
In whose place was I a guest if home wasn't this flat territory we were on? The hard sidewalk under my shoes, their sense of here. I walked home alone. I say home. I went where my parents paid rent, right? Our house wasn't ours? Overhead, the sky spread out. The sky's country was itself. We had moved from Ontario, but my gut got they didn't mean there. Immigrants, all of us, we'd chorused in assembly. The more immigrants, the kindlier the country, the folksier the mosaic. First the English and the French, then Western Europeans and the Ukrainians, I guess, then Chinese and Indians, then the Guyanese and other such Commonwealth stragglers. Eventually we'd bring into us, Canadians, a panoply of the whole human race. So my sweet young self in Trudeau's after mania believed. Those children's hate had a kind of guilelessness, however, that conveyed my abjection straight from their Canadian parents' hearts. I was foreign to clear distinctions between master and savage, to fantasies of homesteaders who, by subjecting trees to their saws, had mixed their labor with unowned lands. Homesteaders, they called themselves, by principle. Home was theirs because they were the first to fence it. As if we were still at war with whatever made in treaty against their fencing, my existence, existing too near, threatened. My very being entreated something before I ever opened my mouth. Get lost. Here kingly kids drink from institution's cup. Something older than English, yeah, well knows what with his guts he must disagree. Something Francais dit bon histoire, là je parle au-dessus du poète domination, dominion, domicile, home. I protested. One of my parents is here's occupying family. Don't blacken me. Please see my colonists' blood inside. They practiced the policing of reserve on the surface of my brown skin. They practiced homing in on enemy. The land underfoot said, here was here first. We thought about beginnings. Okay, and I put the text for that in the, the text for both of these in the chat. Okay, last bit. Same, similar material, basically same material. I thought I'd be done writing about some of this stuff, but my body just doesn't go away. I'm still carrying around the same body with all the same stuff, all the same lived experience. It keeps following me around. On the highway south of Winnipeg in 1983 was a little town where I was brown and people couldn't see. Yeah, just south of Winnipeg off Highway 403 was a little French Canadian town hadn't seen the likes of me. They gave the cold eye to my mother in the local grocery store. At me, they hurled those good old words I'd never heard before. Teacher looked the other way, fists of gravel in the yard. Mom said, keep your eyes down and it won't go so hard. Mom said, keep your eyes down and it won't go so hard hey my 
damn law. I was born here just like you. In this idea of a country we're all living through. Hey, Monsieur Law, I was born here just like you. In this idea of a country we're all living through. Up at Saint Vital. What? Saint Vital, they had my dad. Braid bright Saint Cyr fleche. They told me to go home like they would take, like I would take their land away. They called this river red. They taught me songs of Jacques Cartier. They were full of words for things brown people didn't ever really say. They were winning games that they never let brown people ever play. Hey, Madame La, I was born here just like you. In this idea of a country we're all living through. Hey, Monsieur La, I was born here just like you. In this idea of a country we're all living through. That's it. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks. So um, this is the portion where uh, if you have any questions, feel free to shout them out, raise your hand, put them in the chat, uh, any, any questions at all. And um, we've got Sonnet for, I think, another 15 minutes or so. So it's, it's a great time. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious about your uh, writing process for, for song. Um, does it happen usually the poem first or together or uh, music first or improvised? Um, because my practice up until I started trying to play, which is, it's about five years now since I decided I would try to write songs. Um, I do tend to start with the words and that this particular one that's called Song for Ile Shain, you'll see that I, I dropped the text in, that's published as a poem. Um, I find sometimes now I'm getting, like I get solicited to write poetry and because I still want to write songs, I'm writing things that I'm like, okay, hopefully that's publishable, which is hard, right? Because I think, um, I do think that on the page, they might be quote unquote too simple or simplistic because there's, there's so much um, information in music that the complexity comes from the storytelling and and information that, that's in the melody and in the harmonies and so i'm just learning that still um so i i tend to start with um start with the text i've made i've made a few songs out of old poems from my second book from Kalarno. yeah thank you thank you so much Sonnet, I'm wondering, um, you know, when you're engaging with audiences, whether it's a classroom or at a writer's festival, for example, at a reading performance, if um, if people sort of mistake your work for simplistic, you know, one of the things we like to do with, with Creative Mornings is find artists that complicate the theme uh, so that, you know, uh, with simplicity, there's this idea that, oh, we write, she's doing erasure poetry or she's, you know, reworking existing texts. Uh, which, of course, is a very complicated uh, process, but I think to the sort of untrained eyes that were, or, un or even untrained ear, um, it might come off as simplistic. And I wonder sort of how you might react to that. So, so for you, like um, the longer poem that's an erasure poem still could read that, could land that way? I don't think after hearing it, no, it's yeah, extremely complicated. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, in some ways I'm almost happy to hear it. I'm like, really? Because I, <laughs> I, my, my self-consciousness is around 
the density because that uh, in the book like that one is one of the more narrative accessible ones like there are ones where I dump a whole bunch of like plant research or geology research or like I don't know theology like there's a bunch that are really um dense and I I thought that I'd be able to get away with speaking more narratively and maybe less metaphorically in the in the storytelling itself because there was kind of this textual um conceit of the of the overwriting that lent that lent a complexity to to the text no matter what i talked about i do have some that are that are about like waiting for some guy to facetime me back and yeah um I got to say that's not something that, that that anybody has ever said about this particular work but the sound poems in my in my second book I've got I've got some more uh that are very simple to read sound poems that I find resonant um but maybe might require being brought through them or maybe they are super simple i don't know maybe they are super simple and they're just like little pieces of music i don't know i think maybe that's what i was uh thinking of in terms of like your your backlog of oh okay oh, okay that's yeah uh, i think yeah. Yeah, I was, it was great to hear you respond anyway and i know we have other questions oh, and okay. um, there's also a question in the chat but maybe we'll start with daniela okay and just don't forget to unmute um, yeah, thank you. Great conversation. One of my questions on it is um, I edit a lot of uh, manuscripts and narrative poems seem to be quite um, common. And I mean, if you, if you look at Rattle, for instance, magazine, there's predominantly narrative poetry. Um, and so I'm curious uh, what your view is on this uh, poetry as a narrative type genre in some ways with less of the density of the poetic device and the focus on poetic device, but more as a place to tell a story, which in some ways is the case with your, your song. And then you have to look at it on the page. And then we have, of course, the spoken word poets who then have to struggle how to represent their work on the page. Mm -hmm. and at some point so i'm curious what your thoughts are around that crossovers well i've got to say that writing songs has deepened my appreciation for narrative right and that for the purposes of not that i didn't always love narrative like when that seemed to be the main thing that somebody was going for in genre like a novel or a short story where i knew that that was the form that people were working with and I my taste would have probably lent or leaned away from poems that seemed to simply want to tell a story in a short space. But I mean, to the skill in order to do that often does require a lovely precision of language and usually means reaching for metaphor as well. So uh, I think I could always still recognize when it was done well. Um, and I would say now though, uh, in writing songs, because for my taste and for my mind that just likes to have a, a big game to play, like I really need a lot of things going on in the, in the work in order to satisfy myself, um, complexity in the language is not going to achieve the connection that I want to achieve. So so narrative is like i just am so interested in how can i tell the story a story that has a tiny little or maybe not tiny but like a concentrated little impact or a concentrated big impact a small impact that's like somehow really dense um does that answer your question Daniela? oh totally totally and it's interesting at once i had to sub for someone at a storytelling um, like open mic <laughs> by accident. And they said that the way they preface there, if time passes, it's a story. If time doesn't pass, it's a poem. Don't read a poem. Oh, OK. Well, that's a, that's a. I thought that was a very interesting distinction. That's an interesting frame. 
Yeah, because yeah. You know, a poem can inhabit a moment. It does different things with time and you can have a moment that lasts yeah. for like two minutes on the page. Or stop uh, time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks Thank for you. that, yeah. Meharuna. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, oh, I just, uh, first it's a comment. I, I hope I can make a comment first. Um, I absolutely love what you just did, um, the the reading and then the song. And um, I think there's two different, two different uh, sort of reactions I had. But before I go into that, you, you just said writing songs has deepened your appreciation for the narrative. And I'm curious to know in what way has it deepened for you? Like how, how has it deepened for you? What does that mean for you? I think it's the orality. I think that um, that I mean the the sonnet Shakespeare has a vis visual element to it in the sense that I'm deliberately hiding a Shakespeare sonnet in there, and so that dense block of text is part of the experience. And I know that I'm holding something down on the page so that somebody's eye could see that there's this line at the bottom. And when they get there, be like, oh, that's that's how it connects up to back to the top, right? And so even though you have to experience the visual text in time, I feel like uh, a poem on the page offers that to the eye and to the reader, even in the like, almost like the edges of the reading where where you can go back and see, make those connections or read it again, right? And just be like, wow, this is something that offers something new to me each time. Whereas a song, it's usually being offered in the moment, body to body, through the air. They don't get to look at the text. They only get to hear it once. So the conventions of story, of setting up a situation that, that takes us through a small experience, right, in an intelligible way, uh, that, that has just deepened my like I can't just I can't just put a bunch of him I mean I could I could be like Nirvana and just be like an albino a libido like I could just put a bunch of images together and it would work but um part of my my own drive to go towards song is some need to connect in another more satisfying way for me and so whatever's going on with that need to connect is is reaching for narrative. Beautiful. That's exactly how I felt. Like um, when you sang, when, when you played, there was a there's a there was a completely different connection that happened for me. At a, I, I was crying like I wanted to cry. There was a whole other emotion that came. And um, when I, I'm a poet as well, and when I what I've done is uh, I usually give my poetry, I collaborate with musicians and I, I, I give them my words and I say, come up with whatever you want. I don't tell them the meaning or anything. And so then the, a pianist or a cellist will just come up and do what they wanna do. And then I will recite the poem. And I love that because there's just all these layers of feeling and, uh, bodily feeling that I have that I wouldn't have otherwise just from just the reading reading is completely different so yes thank you so much I, I love what you did thank you thank you I see the before we go back to uh, Daniela uh, there's a question from Elizabeth do you find flow easier to step into with poetry or with music or is there a difference in your practice and I thought that's kind of Sure. What we're just chatting about, but we didn't quite pinpoint that specific question. Hi, Elizabeth Monier Williams. Hello, hello. This Elizabeth's an old, an old friend. Um, I, I honestly, I started doing music because I felt. Um, I don't. I wouldn't even say blocked is the word. Like, like, you know, when a when you're on a bicycle and you hit a big patch of soft gravel and you stop, like just kind of like, whoosh, like I had no, um, no forward motion anymore for text for a while. So uh, it doesn't mean that I have a, 
it actually doesn't mean I have a super amazing flow because it, the the movement that I got into it was seven years to write sonnet Shakespeare it was a long time to with that um, kind of intricate process. So I was really able to step into that knowing what I was doing each time. And things came uh, maybe not quickly, but certainly sort of relatively consistent consistently and with a with a kind of flow and with the songs because I still feel like I'm like, how do songs even happen? <laughs> uh, where does melody even come from? How does we how do we do that? Um, some of them are this compositional practice where I'm like a text melody and I put it all together like very purposefully and then sometimes they just come out like a like a big clot that I'm coughing up or something like bleh, like a lovely clot but still <laughs> yeah uh, I hope that answers your question Elizabeth. Right. And we want to go over back to Daniela. Oh, um, I just loved what Meheruna said as well. And just adding to the conversation here, I've had a lot of conversations about um, experience, auditory experience versus page experience. And for instance, the first poem you showed us that was visually um, impactful. Um, it will be a very different experience listening to someone interpreting that poem auditorily. And the same, in some ways, um, I play a lot with my work and I do a lot of things for someone reading on the page. And they have a very different experience, I think, from what I do when I actually make an interpretation in a reading or a performance with musicians. And it's funny because, like, I was taught, well, you got to read what's on the page. And yeah, that, there's a huge element to that. But I just fought that because I thought that those two experiences were very different. And I felt very alone when I spoke about, no, this is just for you on the page. And this is just for you, the listener. And those are two different things, even though they meet somehow on that page, somehow. But each time I speak it, it's different. Exactly. I yeah. thought, what is your take on that, considering that the song was very auditory and the poem, the block poem was very visual? Um. I how they meet I am trying to think of how I mean I knew that the I knew that the visual dimension is silenced in the read in the reading of the sonnet Shakespeare I'm trying to think of how many poems that I have well actually Keegan uh I'm going to be giving you some concrete poems like those are the poems that I've never tried to read out loud most of them <laughs> okay yeah. right like I was about to say, do I have any poems where where the visual experience is quite a bit different than the auditory experience? And I, it makes me wonder if I've just avoided, like I've never tried to vocalize some of the, yeah. the concrete work. Uh, yeah, not sure, Daniela. It's always there to try, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is nice. Uh, I think uh, we'll have a uh, last uh, question from Meharuna and then we'll start to wrap up. Yeah, I was curious, uh, Sonnet, to know, have other musical traditions influenced you in some way or have you explored? So where I'm going with this is thinking around um, like Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan or like the in, in my in my Indian traditions of Gowalis and um, uh, guzzles that are in music um, are deep layered poetry so I, i'm wondering if if you've explored these other indian um south asian is what i'm thinking of because that's my identity of traditions yeah vocal yoga <laughs> the note from heaven so yeah. both of these uh are texts that are helping me connect um like yoga and breath practice and sounding and my body that has its ancestry like the ways in which i am interested in my identities and ancestries through the music like i mean my whole last book both so many of my the whole my whole over basically the whole thing is like wait I speak in this colonial language in in a space and like the culture of the space that I live in 
is shaped by that colonial ideology and the, and the language is an artifact of that. So I like the cells of me that are not, uh, that are, that don't have a European genealogy when my body means to express and it has to express semantically in this structure that is the structure of the oppressor, uh, Blah. Like that's, that's where my, po like a lot of the energy of my poetry comes from that. So now I am trying to kind of honor that in another way, which is to um, connect the sounding to a grounding and spiritual and, uh, you know, yogic tradition. So from those, those places. Um, that's also pretty new. It's not like I have, uh, I have never written about it. Um, so, but, but yes, if that's, if that helps, like, I think that's, I'm coming from that place. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm reminded of, um, a performance I saw earlier this year or last year by Vivek Shreya, uh, how to fail as a pop star. And uh, in it, she talks about, uh, the religiosity of early singing and then trying to you know, be confronted with a Western <laughs> pop audience and how it just totally blew up, you know? And it's it's turned into a book as well, so it's uh, available in different formats, which was uh, fantastic. I so um, want to see that show here, like being here on the in Nanaimo and on the island, like every time that show has come around, I've not been able, but apparently they're gonna, they're making it into a show, like a, like a, like a show show, a like CBC, a CBC gem or something like that? I think so, yeah, so that would be fantastic. It's something to watch out for. So um, thank you for your question. It's always nice to see you. Um, before we close out, I, um, <laughs> Danielle's, Danielle's asked, uh, which brings us to the conversation about form poetry that originates in a certain language. Yes, yeah. Um, Speaking of colonial structures, I <laughs> it so much. I hated form poetry because I was hearing my Eastern European rhythms and half notes and speed, speed up and slow downs. Just wanted to throw that in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once on it had um, alluded to, so so uh, before we go, I do want to uh, highlight the Victoria Festival of Authors. I've dropped in uh, both the just the general website for the festival as well as the Eventbrite page. And so the festival is pay as you may, and it's all live streamed as well as in person. So if you're not in Victoria next uh, next month, uh, you can log on, and I think it'll even be recorded uh, and then distributed after the fact. But anyway, uh, Sonnet is uh, performing uh, or taking part in the opening night, which is uh, Wednesday, October 11th at 7.30 p.m. And the whole festival is hosted at Langenport Theatre in Victoria. And um, the event on that Wednesday is called A Word After a Word After a Word. And it talks about the process of writing and and the little blurb says, it's so mysterious, this process of writing. <laughs> so in this panel, uh, we will talk to four well-known, deservedly praised authors as they pause in their work to let us know how it's going. So it's uh, it's gonna be great to see Sonnet in conversation with her peers and uh, thinking about uh, just the way uh, words come together <laughs> uh, for this audience. And if you are um, in town and at the Langenport Theater, uh, they will be in a show uh, with me and a few other uh, concrete poets uh, in the lobby at the Langham Court Theatre, including uh, Christine Wald and Bill Bissett um, and a few other uh, kind of local luminaries. So it's going to be exciting to see Sonnet's concrete poetry and maybe someone will attempt to orate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you, Sonnet. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Uh, if you um, want to spread uh, this talk around after the fact it'll be uploaded to the website hopefully this weekend uh, we always send out uh, the previous month's uh, link in the up upcoming newsletter uh, for the victoria festival or pardon me for the victoria arts council <laughs> so many people involved right now uh, the next month at the last friday of october we'll be hosting um, artist cornelia van vorst uh, talking about the theme of endurance so that should be great uh, and if you know cornelia's work she does a lot of work around memory and trauma and endurance so it should be a very rich conversation uh, but so thank you everyone and thank you sonnet thank you so much this was wonderful thank you sonnet
Thank you, Kosa. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.